I wanted to take the time to go through some new data that's come up over the uh, last um, year or so, uh, couching what are the breast cancer risks in um, individuals with inherited breast cancer genes and what are the inherited breast cancer genes? So just taking a step back, why do we do testing, right? So it can guide, uh, testing can guide medical treatment at point of care in the context of an active cancer diagnosis. So whether it's through chemotherapy, surgery, or radiation. Also, it can help guide cancer screening and prevention practices. And then family communication is super important as well. But we need to confirm, quantify, and characterize risks. And that was really the focus of a couple of these New England Journal papers that had come out back in 2021. And I wanted to highlight these because, again, I think this is the best data we currently have to guide what are the risks for um, these genes that predispose to breast cancer and what are the genes that actually predispose to breast cancer. So first we have the BCAC study, which included 113,000 women from 25 countries tested for 34 genes. And what they found was the prevalence of truncating variants in nine genes in cases was 5.6, controls was 1.6%. In the carrier study, which was based on 64,000 women from the US, uh, tested for 28 genes. Again, pathogenic uh, prevalence of pathogenic variants in 12 established genes was very similar to what was seen in the BCAC study. Now, in the BCAC study, the genes that showed up as imparting a higher risk um, of breast cancer, including included the usual ones we think of, BRCA1, BRCA2, PALB2, as well as BARD1, RAD51C, RAD51D, ATM, and CHECK2, as well as MSH6. The findings for the carrier study was similar, but in that study, CDH1 was also found to um, have an increased risk. Tumor phenotype, again, there were no surprises for the most part in what was found um, in association with ER positive and ER negative cases. And the simil similar um, things were seen in um, the carrier study. Now, in um, just of note, in both the BCAC and the carrier study, TP53 and P10 were, did not reach significance in terms of an association with breast cancer. But again, when you actually look at the data, these genes are fairly rare in the population. So there were differences between cases versus controls, but the numbers did not reach significance. So likely it just wasn't a large enough study to be able to see um, the findings. Now in the BCAC study, uh, what, what happened was they separately analyzed the population-based and family-based studies. And as expected, the family-based studies had a larger effect size. And for rare missense variants, breast cancer risk increased by domain. So there were specific domains in both BRCA1 as well as ATM that increase risk specifically. Um, in the carrier study, the prevalence was similar among whites, blacks, and Hispanics. Um, of note, keep this in mind because this is gonna be relevant to one of our cases um, that we talk about, the CHECK2 um, low penetrance variants and this uh, ILE157 THR is sometimes referred to as the I157T variant, as well as this other variant, the odds ratio was about 1.3. So that was excluded from the analysis. And what they also found was that NBN had no increased risks that were seen, including any association with the Slavic founder mutation. And again, this was in the supplemental figure um, the mutation prevalence of pathogenic variants after age 40 decreased rapidly for BRCA1 and BRCA2, but was constant, but there was a constant or limited decline 
for individuals with ATM, CHECK2, and PELV2. And again, in clinical practice, I think that's what we tend to see. Um, in the younger ages, we see a lot of BRCA1, BRCA2, but there's more of a constant um, uh, prevalence that we see uh, among older women with breast cancer for these other genes. Now, there was an accompanying editorial to these articles written by um, Dr. Stephen Nayrod, and really some of the take-home points here were the cases included most mutations in BRCA1, BRCA2, PALB2. In the controls, most mutations were in CHECK2 and ATM. The odds ratio, interestingly, for breast cancer in the BCAC study, so that's um, the worldwide collaboration based in um, the UK, for BRCA1 was uh, 10.6, which translates to a lifetime risk of 55%. But this same group uh, reported on a prospective study um, back in 2017 in JAMA, and the risk reported in this prospective study was 72% by age 80. So take home message here is based on these new results from the New England Journal papers, probably not prudent to revise risk estimates downwards. Now, looking at some of the race ethnicity data, again, this was interesting. What they found was, again, the reported frequency of protein truncating variants among Asian versus European women uh, was reported. And what they found was um, a lower frequency in Asians, but it was attributed to the check to 1100 del C, which is less common. Um, similar findings were seen in the carrier study. Now, just thinking about Asians for a second, when we think about, again, the reason the uh, Asians were grouped together is because, again, when we're thinking about the U.S. census tracts, Asians uh, comprise one group. But thinking in a broader context, Asians represent about 40% of the world's population, but yet account for about 6% of the world's genome sequencing sequences. And putting the findings of Genome Asia 100K project into context as a measure of diversity, Europeans would be grouped into one ancestral lineage, and whereas Asians would be grouped into 10 different lineages. So again, kind of advises us on how, when we're grouping populations, we need to be careful about how, you know, how diverse ancestries may be playing into this. Now, this was a study that was uh, reported back uh, late in uh, late last year. And really what it was looking at is ethnic specific BRCA variation in a number of Asian populations. And what they found was over 50% of Asian BRCA variants were Asian specific. And there were huge differences between the four Asian populations they looked at. And really, so it was India, China, South Korea, and Japan. And when they compared the percent of the BRCA variants that were different from non-Asian, so mainly European populations, in Indians, it was about 44.2%. Japanese, it was almost 90%. And this makes sense because genetically, Indians are closest to Europeans from an ancestry standpoint, and Japanese are the most distant. So the study demonstrates the importance of including BRCA variants across Asian populations. Now, again, I don't need to tell this group this, but just a reminder, race is a social construct. So when we're thinking about the popular conception of genetics and five races, really reality is there's a lot more genetic variation than five races. And again, taking a step back, Africa has the most genetically diverse population of any continent. And that's because our current world population really originated out of Africa. And again, this, you know, these papers kind of give us a little bit more context when we're looking phylogenetically 
This is the African population. And it's only this little subset that then went on to form the basis of the non-African population. And again, you see that when we're looking at gene diversity, the diversity in Africa is a lot more than what we see from the populations um, that originated from Africa through serial founder effects. Um, and again, um, when we're thinking about this from the standpoint of, we know that polygenic risk scores are becoming more and more commonly uh, reported on. And again, they're not yet um, used to guide clinical care for the most part, but thinking about um, polygenic risk scores, they're based on SNPs. And when we're thinking about SNPs, we have our causal SNP, and then we have our tag SNP. So SNPs that are close by, that we're using as a surrogate to say, oh, this person may have a higher risk versus this person may have a lower risk. Now, what's important to realize is that um, the haplotype block length, meaning how these um, SNPs track together are longer in people of European ancestry, whereas they're shorter in people of African ancestry because of the higher diversity. So what you might see as a tag SNP related to a causal SNP in someone of European ancestry may not track the same way when you're looking across another population. So again, that's kind of a short way of explaining why sometimes when we're looking at polygenic risk scores, they're not gonna work the same way across various populations. So, while these smaller haplotype blocks can narrow down causal variants more effective. It, so even though these lead to us not being able to have the same tag SNPs across populations, these smaller haplotype blocks can actually narrow down the causal variants more effectively. And again, this is why it presents a tremendous opportunity for discovery work.